Marie et bienvenue à Chute Convenance et merci bien des faits pour l'invitation. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. It's a real pleasure to speak to you today um, in an island I love. So to introduce myself, um, I'm Welsh, as you can hear from my accent, and I'm Welsh speaking. Welsh is my first language. So like many Gerie, I have two languages and two different cultural heritages. I spent my childhood and my teenage years in Wales, where I was surrounded by villages and towns with names such as Strangmanach, Llanell, and Pont Cysylltau. Side by side with these, there were others. Grosmont, meaning the big mountain. Bomaris, the beautiful marsh. Mould, the high mountain. And very close to where my parents lived, there were two little villages called Frodoli, Lily, and Beaufort, the, the splendid fort. So as you can see, these names had no connection at all with English or indeed Welsh. And then when I took the train to Carlisle to go shopping, I passed by the enormous castle at Caerphilly, built by the Normans. There you can see them building their castles in Wales. <laughs> and in fact, they built a lot of them in Wales. In about 20 square miles from my parents' house, you find enormous Norman castles at Chepstow, at Esk, at Skenfrith, Rosmont, Cardiff, Newport, Abergavenny, all that in just 20 square miles. In South Wales alone, we find about 80 Norman castles. And there's another 24 in North Wales as well. And I haven't even started mentioning the scores of Norman churches that we find in South Wales. In, for example, places such as St. Asaph, St. Cadvans, the beautiful Iweni Priory, Santoni Abbey, Tintern Abbey, and then we go to Monmouth, on the very border between England and Wales. And what you find in Monmouth is a very beautiful Norman gatehouse, which was built by the Normans uh, to protect Monmouth from the Welsh who uh, slightly objected to their presence. <laughs> so as you can see, even without knowing it, as a child growing up in Wales, I was surrounded by things Norman. I didn't really realize it until my teenage years, but when I did come to be a teenager and realized that it wasn't the norm to have all these castles all around wherever you lived, I began to actually think more about it and thinking, well, who, who were these Normans then? What were they doing? Well, now I work in England. I work at the University of, of Cambridge where I teach French linguistics. And this is my College, Peterhouse, my office is in fact there. Peterhouse is the oldest college of the university. It was founded in 1284 by a bishop called Hugo de Borsham, who must therefore have had Norman origins. So I guess somebody out there was trying to tell me something. <laughs> My job at last gave me the opportunity to study Norman in depth. 
And since I'm British, it seemed natural to look at the Norman of the British Islands, which, as you know, is spoken here. So I duly booked a passage to Jersey, and I arrived in your harbour wondering what I would find, wondering what the Norman of the British Islands would be like, wondering who would speak it, would there be anybody speaking it. Well, you can imagine my utter delight when I found on Jersey not the isolated remains of some language of long ago, but actually a vibrant language community with whom I spent a whole summer speaking Gerier, learning Gerier. I even won third prize in a raffle. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, I found enthusiastic groups who were working incessantly to preserve a living and a dynamic language. So I must, at the outset, thank very warmly the Section de la Langue of the Société. I'd like to thank the Assemblée du Gerier and, of course, l'Office du Gerier for helping me learn Gerier and for introducing me to many uh, of you, many people here who are present today, who gave me hours and hours of their time um, <coughs> to help me study your language. So then I went back to Cambridge and Cambridge University have taken a great interest in my research and have agreed most enthusiastically to in let me incorporate the study of Gerier into the courses that I teach in French linguistics at the university. So this is a finals exam paper in the course that I teach. And most of one <coughs> term of the finals course for this paper is spent looking at Norman. We look at the historical development, we look at the contemporary situation, we look at the phonetics, the sounds, the vocabulary, and the rich diversity that we find in the language. My students are absolutely fascinated by it. This week, for example, what they are doing is downloading the Gerier Christmas carols on the office website, listening to them, looking at them, at the booklet that you can download as well, and they're going to tell me on Tuesday what they found, how it's like French, how it's different to French. My students are absolutely fascinated by it. So, why should we learn Jerry? Basically because in 2013 it's essential to be able to speak more than just English. Native speakers of English often forget that being able to speak just one language is something of a rarity in the modern world today. And I would suggest it's not a very advantageous rarity either. It's a proven fact that we can gain cognitive benefits from being bilingual. Speaking two languages has been proven to improve the functionality of your brain. Students who are bilingual basically just tend to be better than monolinguals at multitasking, at maths, at reading, at problem solving. The statistics are there. Being bilingual improves your memory. And actually, if you speak a second language, it often improves your English, because you become aware of the structure of language and how that operates. And so you become a better communicator overall. More prosaically, we can also derive economic benefits from being bilingual. And I would suggest that Jersey is an island very well placed, both geographically <coughs> and economically, to reap the considerable advantages 
on offer here because bilinguals are just more marketable. They're more employable. You think of your finance industry, your <coughs> tourism industry. Bilinguals are more attractive <coughs> candidates for employment. Bilingual people are just better at multitasking. I mean, there's even been studies in the States, for goodness sake, that show bilinguals are better, safer drivers, okay? Basically, you can't lose. Being bilingual just makes you smarter. <laughs> so again, we come back to the question, okay, well, why learn Jerry? Why not world languages, so-called world languages, like French or Spanish or, or, or German? My answer to that would be, why not start with Gerrier? Because language learning skills are highly transferable. If you equip yourself with the ability to speak a second language, then learning a third one, a fourth one, becomes increasingly easier. And so by teaching Gerrier to your school children, you can give them all these cognitive benefits associated with language acquisition skills that I've already mentioned, but there's the added bonus that you're giving them an awareness about the unique language, culture, and history of the place in which they're living. And no other language can do that for them. I was talking to somebody from the Jersey Evening Post yesterday who seemed to be very interested, and I happened to mention to her about the place names. She was astonished to find that Litak meant a stack of rocks. And she said, oh yeah, okay, I, I never really thought about that before. The hook, what's that? Is that just an empty place name, or does it tell you what the toponymy? It's a hillock. They longed, it's a mall, it can be, it's fields where hemp is grown. All of a sudden, a familiar landscape that this person had known all her life suddenly became alive to her. I put Europe on the board now. I know you're not a member of the EU, don't worry. <laughs> At a time when minority languages are being increasingly protected and recognized <coughs> by the European Union, surely the simple fact of being politically outside that union doesn't somehow just conveniently absolve Jersey of the moral duty to safeguard its linguistic heritage. You have, after all, a 2005 cultural strategy seven points. <coughs> Teaching Gerrier ticks all the boxes. That's not bad actually, is it, ticking seven out of seven boxes of your cultural strategy. On Jersey, you've got, and I'm aware, different types of people who live here. You have the, the Jersey-born people who speak Gerrier the Jersey-born people who don't speak Gerrier, and then the people who um, are just not born in Jersey. Well, I've heard, actually, people in both those last two groups say, nobody speaks Gerrier in my family. I've got absolutely nothing against the language, but it's just not relevant to me. Really? If you speak English, then of course it is. Because your people, the Normans named it so. English has been sculpted, has been shaped by Norman. You may have seen something like this before, the story of the, the meat in English. The one where people say, well, all living animals have good Anglo-Saxon names, ox, calf, sheep, etc. But once they're served up on a plate, then they are used by <laughs> French, they use French names for them. Okay, the story's a bit of a stereotype, it's the first thing you ever hear when people talk to you about the history of English. But actually, 
actually it's true. When your Duke William invaded England in 1066, he changed it forever. He changed its social structure, he changed its custom, its practice, but goodness me, he also changed its language. As you know, you can hardly construct a sentence of English without using a word of Norman origin. And this is precisely why English is so different from the world's other Germanic languages. Think of the word pocket. We think of it as an English word, don't we? What's pocket in German? Tasche. Hmm, doesn't look very like pocket. What about Dutch? Sark? Nope. Pocket, of course, is from Puchet. It's a borrowing from Norman. It means a little bag. Another word, faith. Good old English word? No. Faith. In German, is Glaube. In Dutch, it's Geloof. <laughs> faith is a borrowing from Norman. It's from the same word as you have in Gerie, Fe or Fe. And indeed, between the 12th and the 15th centuries, Norman, sorry, English borrowed 10,000 words from Norman. Government, crown, state, empire, reign, royal, sovereign, court, council, parliament, all of these words are borrowings from Norman. And I could go on and on and on, I won't. <laughs> from Norman. 10,000 words borrowed by English from Norman. For 300 years after the Norman conquest, Norman was the language of English nobility. And during this time, it's clear that Norman was used as the main language at court, <coughs> in business, in the law courts, <coughs> in administration, and even in certain schools. And now let's look at the UK Parliament. Parliament, as you now know, being a Norman word. Well, the Queen is absent from sessions of the Parliament, and so a clerk has to say that she's giving her assent to the laws that are passed. How does this clerk say it? In Norman. La Reine Le Veux, the Queen wishes it. Back to my home territory, Cambridge. Did you know that during the 13th and 14th centuries, the statutes and <coughs> audiences of the University of Cambridge and Oxford actually, decreed that students had the right to speak either in Latin or in Norman, but not English. Hmm. And Norman has left an indelible mark on English. Before the conquest, English had a sound But you couldn't use it at the start of words. Well, today, as you know, there are loads of words with English with, 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 at the start. An example being very, what a really common word that we use all the time. But not actually an English word. It's a borrowing from Norman, from the word vrai, true. So what I'm trying to say is that Norman forms a core element of our lives on the British islands. And in order to understand the history of English, it's absolutely essential to have some knowledge about Norman. So to say Norman is not relevant to me is not actually true. If you speak English, of course it's relevant to you. But it doesn't end there, does it? 
because the modern English of Jersey is also marked by its contact with Gerie. And in the present climate of globalization, an awareness of local speech can be very important with regard to national identity. Gosh, I think that's ticked a box in your cultural strategy. On Jersey, lots and lots and lots of people are using Gerie words without even realizing it. Take my own case. I've spoken English all my life. And yet when I first came to Jersey, I heard many words and expressions that I didn't understand. Here are a few examples. Haughty <laughs> for a sloping patch of land. I didn't have a clue what that meant. A bit old. Frack for seaweed connetable. I thought, well, that's funny. Why not, why not constable? Basham for an open, large open um, pan, a preserve pan. Broncage for your tradition of keeping uh, the, the, the lanes clear at a certain time of year. You all use these words. Everybody in Jersey understands these words. I didn't. They are speaking Gerie. They just don't know it. People on these islands are constantly using these terms. So I would suggest that what needs to be done is to create a link between the everyday speakers of Gerie and these what I could call hidden, latent speakers of Gerie. And of course that's not an easy thing to do when you have uh, a situation where a language isn't being passed down so much within the family. But I think it's very important to emphasise that the linguistic element of Jersey's history is an inclusive one that everybody can participate in and that is relevant to everyone. Because if you don't include people, that's tantamount to alienating them. So I think the way ahead is to make everybody realise that they too can appropriate the linguistic element of Gerie identity. And if you've got to convince them, why not make it fun to do that as well? And this, of course, is where the hard work of the Office du Gérier in increasing the visibility of Gérier in the everyday life of Jersey is so, so valuable. Teaching Gérier in schools has also made the language very accessible to the younger generation. But in the wider context, putting the language on your banknotes makes it visible. Putting it in your airport. I love the fact that you've got Jerry on recycle bins. It makes it, it makes it commonplace, it makes it everyday, it makes it normal. You've got it on your buses as well. It's exactly what we need. You've got a band, and actually a very good band. I heard them in Ketu last May. They sing in Jerry. This allows the whole Jersey community to share in the linguistic component of Jerry identity. <coughs> and of course then, the courses in the Pagnon offer an entry point if young people want to take the next step. And, you know, incidentally, what a fantastic next step. What a great way to teach Gerie, being able to teach parents and children alongside each other. You know, this is mutual reinforcement within the family. It is the very best thing you can possibly have. So all of these steps make Gerie accessible to young people, but it continually reinforces the image of Jersey as a bilingual island. You can't force people to learn Gerie, but you can make it sufficiently high profile and attractive to make them want to learn it. And how absolutely wonderful that you've got Gerie blogs, a Gerie Facebook interface, Gerie Twitter, Gerie learning from the computer. 
exactly what you need. This is the <coughs> modern face of Gerrier. Children love stickers. Give them Gerrier stickers then. <laughs> Make it fun. Make it enjoyable for them. <coughs> the Norman tongue has been spoken continuously from medieval times. Now actually, not many languages can lay claim to such a long linguistic pedigree. Standard French, for example, doesn't really exist in the way we think of it today until about the 16th century. There's certainly nothing we can describe as a standard French text from the medieval period, even though there's plenty of Norman texts. You may have heard of the famous Chanson de Roland. This was written in the 11th century in what linguists term Anglo-Norman. It's been described as one of the oldest major works of literature in the French-speaking world. But it doesn't just belong to medieval times. It has relevance even today. It's alluded to in Graham Greene's work, The Confidential Agent, for example. And it's been made into pop songs in the UK and France and even Norway. Well, if the Chanson de Roland is unfamiliar to you, then I know that the Roman de Roux won't be. I'm absolutely thrilled every time I see this inscription in your royal square. This reminds visitors and islanders alike that Jersey was the home of one of the most important writers of medieval times, Maître Vass. And he writes proudly, Je dis et dirai que je suis Vass de l'île de Jersey. I say and say again that I am Vass from the island of Jersey. How incredible that this little island, what are you, eight miles by five? You've given rise to a literary figure who will be studied as long as French literature exists. about links and Jerry's potential as a way of developing cultural collaboration with mainland Normandy. In, when I go to Normandy, I've, I've been in the last few years quite a few times to, to Normandy, and actually it's been clear that most people in France think of the Channel Islands as part of the UK. I know you're not, you know you're not, but that's how you are perceived. You are perceived as looking towards London, you are perceived as English speaking, and many people, even living in the Cotentin, have not visited. Now then, language is a very, very powerful identity marking feature, because it can forge an immediate link between people, or it can completely distance them. And forgive me for a second while I completely distance you. And in Shana Kamai, I stay with Hana Hibahidi as <laughs> between Do you see how we can bring you together or push you away? Now you'll know far better than me, but I'm sure there's some role for Gerrier to play in reminding the Normans of La Grande Terre, of, of mainland Normandy that although King John's defeat in 1204 led to Normandy becoming a fragmented linguistic territory, the Normans are all one people. You are all united by a common tongue. But simply, Normandy extends beyond the geographical boundaries of France. <coughs> And in fact, a very famous French linguist, Charles Le Jaurès, published a book in 1886 called Des Caractères de l'Extension du Patois Normand. And he described in it what he considered to be the defining features of Norman. Now, as you can see, Jersey is not a very good representation of Jersey, but Jersey is part of the same linguistic territory as the Cotentin Peninsula, as the north of Calvados, and even bits of Seine-Maritime. 
Just to give you a quick example of this, think of the word for cow in French, vache. Cat in French, chat. Not in Jersey, it's vac and ca. And it's also vac and ca in the Cotentin and in the Pays du Co, in the Seine Maritime area. You are united by a common tongue. And Jersey also has many words in common with mainland Normandy, such as doublier, tablecloth, qui, thatch, pook for a bag, gradil for a current, and scores and scores and scores of others. Now these words are not understood by French people. But a Jerry speaker from saint Juan and a Norman speaker from the Cotentin will both be able to understand these terms without any difficulty at all. And then finally, in terms of cultural links, it's very likely that the re-blossoming of Norman literature in the Cotentin in the 19th century was in large part due to influence from the very flourishing literary climate in the Channel Islands. Many of the 19th century Gérier authors were incredibly prominent figures in Jersey society at the time. And the fact that these prominent figures wrote in Gérier seems to have been responsible for the resurgence of writings of Norman in mainland Normandy. So I'm thinking now about uh, names that would be familiar to you, figures such as Philippe Longlois, who, uh, as you know, was a member of the States. He was a Jura of the Royal Court. Or uh, Sir Robert uh, People Maret, who we have here, who uh, was bailiff of Jersey. Auguste Asplé Le Gros, who was connétable of St. Peter's, also a Jura of the Royal Court. We may only be able to suggest their influence rather than prove it outright, but I can give you one definite and irrefutable example of the literary influence that Gérier writings exerted on the Cotentin, and that's the, uh, the case of Philippe Le Sueur Morin's comic character, Bram Bilo, whose adventures were recounted in the Nouvelle Chronique de Jersey newspaper uh, in the form of letters to the editor. Now this sparked off a whole tradition of writing which was then seized upon in Normandy, in the mainland now I should say, and became extremely um, influential. Uh, there, for example, you have Octave Maillot, famous writer, who took on uh, the Brambilo type writings for his character. He transposed them into his character uh, Théophile. It was also taken up on Guernsey. Um, by Thomas Alfred Groot, but you're probably not as interested in that. All our relations are kissing cousins. Very well from all ways. As you can see then, Gerry and Gerry culture are in fact relevant to all Jersey's population, whether or not they are actually Jersey born, whether or not they actually speak. And I've also tried to show you that the linguistic links that Jerry shares with mainland Norman could, I think, be emphasized to express a sense of a shared linguistic identity, which certainly has the potential to be beneficial in the area of cultural collaboration. Once Jerry is gone, <coughs> gone forever. The Norman French of Aldeny, Aurigny, is extinct forever. You as a community should cherish and nurture the uniqueness that you are so lucky to have. Merci, Van